go to Berlin, to go to Berlin for the first time to attend InnoTrans. That is the, uh, the largest rail trade show in the world. It's every two years, or it was every two years, but as you all know, um, planet Earth closed in 2020, and it was postponed, I think, twice before they decided to move it from April 2020 to September of last year. So we decided to um, go again. <clears throat> and um, the exposition is four days, but we, of course, have to turn it into a two week trip. We hadn't been to Milan, Italy, or Milano in many, many, many years. I hadn't been there since the ERA tour in 1988. So I was way overdue for a return visit. Um, and even though I was in Vienna and Berlin just uh, four years ago, um, such a problem. So you go again, there's always lots to see. So we started off in Milan and the uh, Milan Transit Authority is Azienda Trasporti Milanese, ATM. And this is the current tramway network. Um, you can see the metro lines in thinner colors um, underneath this. This is not an official ATM map, by the way. I found this on the interwebs. Uh, this was done by a fan uh, back in, hmm, I think, 2019. Uh, but all the routes are still effective. Um, Paul, tell me if you can see my cursor. Yes. OK, up here at the top, that was the last Milanese interurban line. And it started at the Comasina Metro terminal of the uh, Line 3 and went north to Limbiate. By last year, it was only operating rush hours only and Saturday morning. So it was operating when we were there last September, but we didn't think it was going to end. Meanwhile, I think the following month or a couple of weeks later, service terminated and they are supposedly rebuilding the entire line. Um, it was being held together with um, spit and polish and the track work was getting very seedy. Um, so we are hoping that both it and one of the other interurban lines that are su was supposedly being rebuilt and coming back someday do in fact come back. So that was a real woulda, shoulda, coulda. And um, well, we didn't. Anyway, as you can see, Milan's tramway system is very extensive. And between a couple of different routes, there is a um, circulator set of lines around the old city, which is right there in the middle. The great thing about Milan, and I'm sure all of most of you know this, is their Peter Witt double truck motor cars from 1928, 1929 are still running around. A lot have been sold off to various museums uh, here, there, and everywhere. Uh, Market Street Railway in San Francisco, for example, and many other places. They originally had 500 of them. There are still about 200 left. And surprisingly, there are representatives today from all six of the original manufacturers from the 1920s. And that's probably because there were, and I'm guessing, I really don't know, uh, maybe Carl Jackson can chime in. Um, I'm guessing that they were all built to the exact same specifications. So parts wise, they're interchangeable. I have no idea. That's just a wild guess. But like I said, all six of these manufacturers 
are represented today. So here we are, the very the first full day, actually the day we arrived in Milan from an overnight flight, Thursday, September 8th. And this is just eh, two or three blocks from our hotel. Um, this is right at Piazza della Repubblica. Um, and we're starting off, and of course, you know, the Peter Witts make all the right noises. Um, it's such a flashback. It's, it's amazing. It's a rolling museum. The whole city is a rolling museum. Most importantly, today, Milan considers the, uh, the Peter Witts to be a part of the fabric of the city. And they're not going anywhere. Uh, they have rebuilt them probably many times over the decades. But um, you'll see an example later on of a builder's plate, a rebuild plate from just a couple of years ago. They're not on every single route in Milano, but they're on many, many of them. This particular car from Carmenate e Torsele is, I think, the most, for whatever reason, the most famous of the six builders. Um, sometimes you see C and T noted as the builder of a Peter Witt when they weren't, but that's neither here nor there. So this is on the number one route, which goes all the way across town. Um, we walked down that main street uh, to probably one of the most famous opera houses in the world, La Scala. And this is at Piazza della La, de La Scala. It's just off to the right. Uh, it's, you have to be very, very patient on very busy streets uh, with the car traffic and the pedestrians. But if you wait long enough, it doesn't take that long. You can get a nice scene uh, without somebody standing right in front of your camera. So this is looking south towards um, the Duomo and the Galleria. Afterwards, we walked up to Central Station, uh, Milano Centrale. And I kind of thought when we were there, and this wasn't my first time there, but I kind of thought, this really reminds me of Washington Union Station. Well, it turns out that Ulisse Stacchini, the architect, modeled it after Washington Union Station. And it opened on July 1st, 1931. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Mussolini was there. Uh, this is one of his pet projects. The place is amazing. It's one of the grandest railway stations anywhere in the world. So this is the entrance hall at street level. Um, the escalator and the staircases on the right take you up to the main hall. This is just one of the departure boards. And you could see that just in, the, in less than two hours, there's a whole lot of trains going to a whole lot of places, even though five of them on this particular day were canceled. I'm not sure why. So this is a good overview from a, a balcony of the main hall of Milano Centrale. And the place is a sea of activity seven days a week. It's funny that the first train that we happened to photograph, um, and yes, this is one of the classic uh, steel or iron arch roofed stub end train stations. So this is one of the many high speed trains operating in Italy, but it's not Italian state railways. It's Nuovo Trasporti Via Giatori, um, NTV. Um, NTV uh, is one of the open access operators in Italy. Several countries now have uh, open access to pri quote, private unquote um, operators. And maybe they are completely private. I'm, I'm not sure of the, uh, the business mechanics of them all. But this is a very recent um, 2017 product from Alstom. All kinds of high speed trains, all kinds of different noses. 
Some of them are Trent, Trentalia, which is the former uh, Ferrovia Ria della Stat, Italian state railways. That's one of them, one of the uh, ETR 700 class Freccia Argentos. Uh, this is older, this was almost, uh, well, it was almost uh, 20 years old, uh, made by Ansaldo Breda. Every train that came in, and this is every couple of minutes, hordes of people are getting off, hordes of people are getting on. Yet another one, a Freccia Bianca, a class E414, made by Alstom in 96. So this is one of the older ones. Looking north from near the end of the platform, extremely classic interlocking towers, which are no longer used, um, but they're in fabulous shape. Um, you can see Cabina A, A cabin closest to us. Uh, in the distance is Cabin C. Um, I'm not sure where B and D were, but the current interlocking tower is out of view to the left. And I'm sure it has, you know, computer workstations. This is just outside the west side of Centrale. Uh, the number nine tram terminates there on a loop. Um, kind of will remind you of a worm. <laughs> These are uh, Ansaldo Breda's, uh, they call them Sirietos, but the basic model is a serial. Right outside that loop is um, the Via Fabio Filzi. And the number five operates north-south here. Um, and it's mostly Peter Witz. This is one from, uh, from one of the other manufacturers, Reggiane. Now, some of the Peter Witts were built in 1928, but I've never found a car by car listing that gave the exact year of the build. So I just called everything 1929. Uh, be that as it may, none of them are new. I was looking up the uh, avenue. This is uh, backed down by uh, Piazza della Repubblica. We then traveled all the way to the um, north side of the city on the number 12 route. And the 12 is one of the routes that has mixed equipment. It's got Peter Wicks and it has these uh, mid 1970s three section articulated made by um, Fiat. So this is just, he's just coming out of the uh, terminal loop. Ah, that's right. Shared by the number one and 12 routes. So the one I believe is solid Peter Witt. going over a uh, bridge over a autostrada, uh, limited access highway. We're working our way south on the route. And here comes that Fiat. Ah, there's one of the rebuild plates, um, already 10 years old. This is Peter Witt 1582. Uh, so this does say 1928. Um, there you go. Further in on that line, um, you've got the one in 12, one in 14 running together here. Uh, one of the four trackless trolley routes that are remaining in Milan crosses um, at that intersection. Um, it's the 91 and the 92, and one operate, it's, it, it, they both circumnavigate the city. 
one of them is clockwise and the other one is counterclockwise. Further down the line, we came across this nice example of a two section articulated on the 19. Uh, this is one of the oldest non Peterwick trams still running, made by Breda uh, in 1960. Doesn't look like it's falling apart either. Every, everything seems to be very well maintained. And there's a, uh, a, nine, a non wrapped example. Even older, 1956, that was the oldest non-Peter Witt that we saw during our stay there. So you've got the one and the 19 on this stretch, um, a goodly amount of private right-of-way. Another example, a Talero as well as a Breda. The uh, 1974 that's closest to us had been an advertising car. And that's the reason for the band around the roof that used to hold ads. You'll see that on other advertising cars. All the lines, even midday, seem to be well patronized. There are a lot of streets that have these huge paving blocks that would be murder on a bicycle, but um, it doesn't matter if you're a tram. This is a, um, there's uh, one, two, three, I think four routes that cross here. Uh, the number 10, as you can see here, is going straight through this intersection. The 19 crosses here. Yes, the 19 crosses here and another route takes the uh, curves to the right. The curve to the left is uh, non-revenue. This is along the Via Vincenzo Monti, um, one of the prettiest residential streets I've seen anywhere in Italy. Um, you could move there tomorrow and be perfectly happy. Um, beautiful, like five-story, six-story old apartment buildings. Very, very tree-lined. Matter of fact, the, the trams and the traffic go through a canopy of leaves. It's really, really pretty. This is where the one in the 19 split um, at... Um, right at the Piazza Virgilio. So he, the number one, is, it's another one of those cars that had been an advertising car with that uh, metal band around the roof. He's turning left and will momentarily hit the, uh, the Milan Nord station. <laughs> Speaking of advertising cars, there you go. Uh, and that is um, Cadorna station on the left. Um, used to be the FNM, the Milan Nord Railway. Whoops, it's all part of um, Tre Nord now, which is a combination of the Milan Nord and a several other lines. So the two big rail operators um, in Milan are um, Tren Italia and Tre Nord. We got back on the number one. We rode all the way to the east terminal up at Greco. So he's coming off the terminal loop. And it's hey, Jeff, yes. Jeff, sorry, sorry to interrupt. A uh, question in the chat. Do the cars have pedal controllers like PCCs? Or um, the? I guess the question is probably in reference to the modern cars. Um, I think so. I think the Fiat's and Breda's might be PCCs, but I'm not certain of that. Uh, don't quote me.
this is right near the, um, well, this is actually, he's turning onto the Ale Tunisia um, on the Route 5. Um, this is another one of those three-way, three tram routes go through here. The 5 is doing that quadrant. The 33 is on the curve that I'm standing on. And the number one goes straight up and down. And there's a northeast bound 33 heading up to Lambrate, about to take the curve. Our hotel was like one block off to the right. It was very convenient. So the next day, Saturday, we decide we, we do a great big multimodal trip. Um, we started off here in Central Station. And we were going to go straight up to uh, Avenso to catch a, uh, a lake boat on um, Lake Maggiore. Unfortunately, the Italian railway was doing engineering work. So our train was only going as far as Sesto Calende, where we then had to transfer for a bus. But it wasn't a long ride. Um, so it really was multimodal. So here's one of their really new uh, Hitachi Italy um, class ETR 421s. Uh, really, really nice EMUs, smooth riding. Excuse me, Arona, not Avenza. So we took the train and then the bus to Arona, got on the lake boat, and we headed up all the way up Lake Maggiore to the end in Switzerland. This was a four hour boat ride. Um, if you have nothing to do on a day in Milan, you wanna do this. It is outstanding, outstanding. And like me, a lot of you are, have multimodal transportation interests. So you will like this. Um, it's extremely, extremely scenic. We're passing through Lessa. going through Stresa, uh, and there are still some, as the name implies, grand hotels. And yes, this is not an inexpensive place to stay, but you will be treated royally. Another one of the stops in Palanza. Um, of course, I was able to look all this stuff up uh, using Google Maps and Google Street View. It's amazing. So it turns out that that mausoleum on the right, if I'm not mistaken, is the guy for whom the station, the former Milan Nord station in Milan is named for, Luigi Cadorna. And if you're into marine transportation, there are all kinds of, of these lake boats on various routes uh, running the length of the lake, and not only Lake Maggiore, which is the biggest, but Lake Como and Lake Garda. Um, there are much shorter ferry routes going across the lake. Um, and then these distance boats making multiple, multiple stops. Uh, we happened to be on one of the express trips, um, and it still made about a half a dozen stops, but there are many more. And of course, this being Europe, if you go to the navigation company's website, Gestione Navigazioni Laghi, you will find the page with the roster of every one of their ships, who built it, when it was built, the engines, you name it, the full data sheets. It's, it's fairly fantastic. So this is one of their older boats um, made by Breda, the naval shipyard arm of Breda in Venice. An even older one made by Breda from 1957, the MV Roma, and we're now near Verbania. Yeah, as you could see, it's not chintzy real estate. And you've got the mountains all around. It's just mountains all around. Um, 
luckily, these sailboards did not get in our way. <laughs> it seemed like there was a hundred of them. But it was a beautiful day, so you can understand why they were out there. Here we are making a stop at Ascona. We're now in Switzerland. We've crossed the border. Um, a 1972 boat from Rodriguez shipyards, the Capriolo. And our destination, Locarno. So this is the ship that we were on, the Rabania. Um, not old, but not new. And notice the uh, they have route and destination signs, electronic. So we um, we had just come up on the, the route 203 from Arona, and it's getting ready to turn around and go right back. Next door was this, the MV Milano. Um, I think this was the oldest ship that we saw, 1952. So you just walk a, a short way and you get to the stub end terminal of the Tilo, the Treni Regionale Ticino Lombardia. And it's one of the regional um, companies now. Um, fairly new. Stadler, Stadler, Flirt. Um, you see Stadler flirts all over Europe, probably all over the world. Um, and this is operating on the S20 suburban line. It's an S-Bahn. They don't call it S-Bahn, of course, but the, the use of the letter S is pretty universal in Europe. What we came here for was downstairs, which you'll see momentarily. Same year, same builder, different paint scheme, same company. But this is operating an RE, a regional, uh, regional express route all the way back to Milano. This is what we came to ride. In 1986, uh, Noah Kaplan, the late Jimmy Mattina and I chased this interurban from Domodossa, Domodossa, Italy, east to Locarno. Uh, but in 1986, this terminal was still up on the street. Um, four years later, in 1990, they built this underground terminal. So this is one of the older, but not oldest, um, EMUs that they operate um, a local Swiss product from Vevey, uh, built in 93. Uh, but we rode the next interval, which used this. Um, it's not, it's one of their panoramics, uh, kind of like the MOB in Switzerland out of Montreux. Um, Needless to say, the viewing out the windows is excellent. We didn't have any station stops en route that were long enough for us to jump out, get a picture, and come back in. So someday in the future, I'll have to chase it again. Anyway, we took that across the Italian Alps um, to here, Domodossola. And we boarded Trenord actually Trenitalia, back to um, Milano. Uh, there are a lot of these Bombardier tracks, electric locomotives in Italy. Um, some of them are newer, some of them are older, though not ancient. You gotta love European locomotives with their double builder's plate. You've got the, um, literally the number plate and then the builder plate. Sitting over on another track was this uh, Swiss, certainly semi-high speed, if not high speed example, uh, built by Alstom eight years previous. Yeah, those are the Alps in the background. 
Next day is Sunday, September 11th. We went back out to that tree-lined residential street to get some more pics. And we came across the mayor of Via Vincenzo Monti, whom you can see here, peering out over his realm. More Peter Witts, what's not to like? This is back at that three-way intersection, Largo Quinto Albini. I think these are PCCs. Um, somebody's more than welcome to give it to Google and look it up. On the south side of Milan is their canals. Venice is not the only city with canals. So this example of a um, serial on the nine, um, this is like a, the, the root nine is like a big letter J. And he just started from the South terminal and is now heading South and then East and then North all the way back up to Central Station where you saw the terminal earlier. A block away from that is the South terminal of the Route 10. Piazza, 24th of May. So something very important happened in Italian history on May 24th. I didn't look it up yet. Just a couple of blocks away, it's one of Milano's um, trolley barns or car barns or depot, deposito. Uh, and this is the Ticinese depot. Nothing is stored outdoors here. Um, we explained to the nice gentleman at the door who we used to work for, thinking we'd be able to walk all over the inside. And he wasn't, he didn't have authority to do that, which we understood, uh, but he allowed us to get us a, a couple of pictures from inside the doorway. So you can see one, two, three, four different kinds of trams here. Peter Witt, of course, uh, and Anselmo Breda from the 70s, a Sirio. And on the extreme left and the extreme right, um, you see the other model who I never saw out on the street. And might have also been made by Anseldo Breda, but since I didn't photograph any of them per se, I didn't look it up. So this is the back end of the depot from the street around the block. Note the intricate rail work and all of the custom made frogs. They don't say it can't be done, they just do it. So then we rode the number 10 all the way across town up towards another depot. And here is the Messina Depot. Again, another huge structure, fully enclosed, nothing's outside, which is great. It's great for security, um, weather protection. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have to worry about snow or ice, generally speaking. And again, here, um, we can get all the pictures we wanted from the doorway, but that was it. Still better than nothing. You can see in the middle there, one of those green other articulated trams. And from the look of it, that's been sitting there a long time and it's very dusty. So I'm not sure what the story is with those. Maybe they're not happy with them. Maybe they're rush hour only. More Peter Witts, more advertising cars. One of the most famous tram scenes in all of Milan, 
Um, and this is good. This is in good sun, morning, noon, and afternoon, uh, right in front of Central Station in the Piazza Duca d'Aosta. And you don't have to wait long to get a shot like this with no car in the roadway in front of you. I don't even think we, we, we're here five minutes. Same spot looking west. It's funny how you see the same advertising car all over the city. Of course, there could be more than one. Like many places, the architecture is a mixture of very old and very new. Could not resist a bus with a pantograph. This is right outside of Central Station, right, now, right next to the uh, number nine trolley loop. Um, practically brand new Solaris Urbino 412. Um, and yes, of course, it's pure electric. And probably at the end of each trip, they raise the pan to uh, recharge the batteries. Um, Mike Licken and all the other bus experts out there, I'm sure can correct me on this. Maybe their range is such that they do not need to recharge on every trip. I suspect not, but, and of course they're in this very trendy green echo paint scheme. Quite nice. So this is the north terminal of the number 10. Uh, the, the railway coming out of Central Station is just two blocks to the right out of view. The number five shares, you may not see it here, but there's an outer track here. And that's what the number five goes on as a goes across the scene. More private right-of-way. It's not everywhere, but it's in a lot of places. This is um, after the number five turns north to head to its north terminal, more private right-of-way. Uh, the 91 and the uh, 92 cross various tramways. You saw one earlier, although we weren't lucky enough to get a trackless crossing at the same time. Um, but we did stick around here. Uh, unfortunately, the eastbound car traffic was such that this was the best I could do right here. Um, this is one of the older, though certainly not old, uh, Van Hools. Milan used to have about eight or nine trackless routes. And in the 70s and 80s, it got reduced down to the current four. Um, but while there's no plans to eliminate them, they apparently don't have any plans to do any extensions yet. Here's one of the really new um, Solaris Trolinos on the 92. So we just walked south on that street that the trackless trolley was crossing a couple of blocks and we come to the northwest terminal of the 33. Um, like a lot, a lot of the tram routes um, go from one end of Milan to the other um, and not usually straight across either. Um, if you look at a route map, You'll see what I'm talking about. So the 33 comes in on the far side, discharges, sits in the loop here um, for time, and then pulls onto the main track. In peak hours, the track going straight is used on another route, but it's just rush hour only. That evening, we decided to have dinner in the Galleria. Um, yes, of all the galleries, this is volume one, 
number one in the world, probably. Um, quite stunning, especially at night. And even though there are lots of very high-end shops, um, the restaurants are very good and not that pricey. They were surprisingly um, affordable. So much so that we went back to the same restaurant two nights in a row. That is the main cathedral, the Duomo di Milano. Um, Construction was started, as you can see, in 1386. And um, it only got finished in the past 100 years. So it was a long, when you hear cathedral project, this is a cathedral project. And a night view of the outside of the Galleria. The, you can see the entrances to the Metro uh, lit up between here and the Galleria. Next day, we had a change in plans. We were gonna do a rail trip up to Switzerland and back, but due to engineering work again, we decided to heck with that, we're gonna do another boat ride, but this time on Lake Como. So, we're waiting around for the 943 departure on track seven to Como Lago. And that is our trusty steed on track seven. An Alstom Coradia Meridian from 2014, um, operated by Tre Nord, formerly Milan Nord Railway. Um, I should add, that back in the old days, the Milan Nord, um, I believe was 3000 volts DC overhead, the same as the Lackawanna. Um, please correct me if I misstated that. Um, luckily, when I was here in 86 and 88, uh, there was tons of their old pre-war MUs still running. Um, Someday I'll have to give you guys and gals a slideshow of that. Um, and Noah Kaplan's darling wife, Cynthia, is standing right there in the light blue uh, shirt. Over on the next track was this bi level. Um, I looked high and low all over the interwebs and could not find a builder or a date for Train Nord's class EB761s. Please feel free to put in the chat a website that gives you roster, detailed roster information uh, for worldwide railways. That is Como. It's very, very touristy and for good reason. Um, it's a beautiful place. You can just come up to Como and spend a day, uh, but there are lake boats going every which way. We were going up to um, Bellagio. Uh, and once again, if you're into marine aviation, all kinds of examples from the same company. This is a very recent example from 2014. Another Italian lake, unbelievable scenery, um, lots of hillsides, lots of mountains. And you just want to get off the ship on every port and just march around. Two examples, fairly recent and quite old from Breda and uh, Navali. We are now in Tremezzo. A different builder, Pissarro Shipyards. Yet another really grand hotel. Built in 1910 and looking brand new. The oldest boat that I saw, um, an actual steamship, the Bisbino, 
Um, it's privately owned today. Uh, Nordic Planet is a restaurant, um, caterer. So you can charter this steamship for an event. Um, very, very old, 1907 example. Our destination, Bellagio. Um, so forget any Bellagio hotel you've ever seen on this side of the pond. This is the real deal. And very worth it. Um, oh, another older example, the MV Ninfea from 1954, built by Breda. This was on one of the uh, shorter um, ferry routes across the lake. Another city, well, another town, another grand hotel. Um, this place I've heard is very expensive. And as you can see, it's very old. Um, I should add that Bellagio, as you, would ex as you might expect, is very, very touristy. And even though we were there on a weekend, a beautiful day, packed with tourists, but not obnoxiously so, um, most of the narrow streets in Bellagio are pedestrian only. There's very little uh, automobile traffic um, on those little streets. Um, it's highly, highly recommended. So we took the ferry from here to Varena, um, just northeast of Bellagio on, the, on Lake Como. And we waited for the next southbound back to Milan, uh, but there was a delay in service. And instead of waiting 15, 20 minutes, we waited about an hour and 15, 20 minutes. But it was a beautiful day. We had nowhere else to go. We had no appointments. And we got a couple of pictures of some other trains. So here's another one of those Karate Meridians heading north on his way up to uh, Colico. Um, Lecco, where this train started, is in between here and Milan, about halfway down. The next day was our travel day from Milan to Vienna. Um, by design, we took three trains. We had to change twice. So the first time we changed was here at Verona. And that was not the train that we arrived on, but it was sitting there. So, hey, it's here. I'm here. I'm photographing it. Another one of those Bombardier tracks, electrics, a little bit newer from 2006. With uh, traditional coaches. Way newer was this uh, class ETR 521. Um, they call them Caravaggio's. Um, built by Hitachi Rail Italy just three years ago. A lot of you have probably seen these in your travels. Um, one of them even tested on the Long Island Railroad. Um, I have slides of one of these in Oyster Bay back in the late 70s, I think. Um, the same one that was on Long Island, I believe was testing on uh, the B&M, MBTA, on the north side of Boston around the same time period. Uh, there are still quite a few of these ALN 668 class diesel MUs. It's their version of an RDC, only they seem to work. Ooh. This is our trusty steed from, um, Verona to Innsbruck. Uh, the train actually started here in Verona and we were gonna go via the Brenner Pass through the Alps. Highly recommended, gorgeous. Um, I'm not sure of the exact age of this uh, Siemens Taurus. Um, but maybe one of you can tell me. We did have time for a stopover. Well, we changed trains in Innsbruck to take us on the last leg to Vienna, 
the train we were on was continuing up to Munich. So the Hauptbahnhof in Innsbruck is not an old structure, it's quite modern. And as you can see, at um, three o'clock in the afternoon, there's three and four o'clock in the afternoon, there's quite a few departures. And a mixture of S-Bahns, regional expresses. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So across the street from the train station, ta-da, is the Innsbrucker Verkehrsbetrieb, Innsbruck Transit Authority. Um, I had not been to Innsbruck since the ERA tour with Jack May in 1990. Uh, way overdue for return visit. And of course, they did not have these Bombardier flexity outlooks <laughs> in 1990, uh, 30 years ago, 30 years previous. And yeah, it's the Alps. Wednesday, our first full day in Vienna. Wiener Linien is the Vienna Transit Authority. That is a track diagram of the Vienna Tramway Network currently. It is huge. And they have eliminated tram routes due to uh, Metro, Underground, U-Bahn, Subway uh, lines. And it's still huge. Um, if you haven't been there, top five places for tramway enthusiasts. And probably one of the best run transit systems anywhere in the world, consistently. So this is just the heavy rail network. Um, the uh, metros, the U-Bahns, um, and the rapid transit frequency S-Bahns. Uh, you can see here the S45 on the top left. Um, that is a separate route that runs on the former, one of the former Vienna Stadtbahn lines. Um, the Vienna Stadtbahn is worth looking up, even on just on Wikipedia at your leisure. Uh, it ran with pre-war cars up until I think the 1980s. Um, this route was replaced and, and this route had been abandoned for a while. And then it came back as the S45. Um, I believe there are proposals to extend it south of Handelskai here. Um, this part of the U, well, the U6 here in um, Brown is former Stadtbahn also. Uh, not the entire route at the bottom, but the main part here um, up to Spiedelau at least, and possibly Handelskai. Um, the pink dashed route here is shown as shown that way because that is very frequent rapid transit headways on the S bahn. You've got the S1, two, three, four, um, seven, perhaps. So if you go down to any one of these stations along here, um, you're going to wait eh, five, six minutes. That's it. I was on my own this day. So um, I started off on the U-Bahn um, right here at Karlsplatz. Um, Karlsplatz is a very big interchange. Um, you've got the U4, but you also upstairs on the street have several tram routes including the interurban to Baden. Um, this particular U-Bahn equipment, the Type U11, is the same style as the original Type U's, um, but they're a bit newer. This example being from 1989. Um, all of the Type U's were built by SGP um, in Austria. Now this is midday and you can see that you've got this train here and the next one's in five minutes. So this is heading um, north 
And this is the first outdoor stop, Stadt Park. So this is one of the newer Type V cars, train sets, not cars, uh, built by Siemens 2013 and I think 2014. Up at Friedensbrücke. Kind of reminds you a little bit of Prospect Park, doesn't it? That's just the other side of the very, very wide platform. This is running along the Danube, the Danube Canal. So it's parkland um, on that side of the train. I've now changed for the U6 at Spitalau. Um, like I said, this is former Stadtbahn. Uh, possibly not right here in this station, but certainly south of here. Um, when the U6 started, um, and it might have been 1994, um, they got these Type T cars from, it's now Bombardier, well, it became Bombardier. Bombardier bought the Lone Werke, um, a local car builder, and of course now they're Alstom. So there was two orders for these cars. These cars can and do operate on street trackage um, to get to car barns for maintenance, although they're bigger than the street cars, which you'll see later. Um, so there's two main batches, the T's built 92 to 2000 and the T1's built 2000 to 2014. And this is already their second paint scheme. They were originally um, white with red trim. Next stop up at Handelskai. Uh, this is the upstairs from the S45 uh, S-Bahn downstairs. And he's heading outbound to Floridsdorf, which was my destination. The, he's, that's a southbound coming across the Danube River. Um, that's mainline railroad on the left. Um, back in 2019, I had um, taken the 25 tramway from Floridsdorf to its terminal in Aspern. And um, several months ago, uh, you saw a photo essay that I did of that in the bulletin. Well, this particular day, I took the 26 route all the way to its terminal at Hausfeldstrasse here. Um, upstairs is uh, the U2 Metro. Uh, this is still, this is a recent extension. Um, I forget when it opened, but it's fairly recently. Um, there are still some farms, working farms out here, um, but I'm sure it'll be built up someday. So this is one of the many, many, many low floor uh, Siemens articulateds. They have these long um, seven section type Bs and B1s, and they have the shorter five section type As and type A1s. Um, but um, the 20, the, the lines out of Floridsdorf Depot um, are some of the lines that still operate with their oldest equipment which are now these um, E2 uh, double articulated and type C5 trailers. Um, the last of the previous older cars just came out of service last year. Um, there was a feature on that in the bulletin last year when it happened. So the motor cars are all built by, of these high level, um, high floor, I should say, uh, motors are, they're all built by SGP and all the trailers were built by Bombardier in the 80s. So in the background, you can see one of the working farms. Um, the, um, the terminal with the connection to the U2 is just a couple of blocks off to the right. It was a rainy day and I did bring my umbrella and Luckily, my camera is hand-holdable, 
So the left hand's got the umbrella, the right hand's got the camera. Doesn't matter. And these days, you just pump up the ISO a little bit, and you have a high shutter speed and good depth of field. God bless digital. Lots of these housing estates, municipal housing estates, these are, from the municipal standpoint, these are analogous to New York City's housing projects. It's the same theory. However, um, these are all nicely done. Um, they're all extremely well maintained. They've been doing this since at least the 1920s. They're still doing it. It's affordable housing, basically, um, all rentals. And every time they let a contract for a new housing estate, um, they get offers from various architects. So the architectural styles from project to project to project, they're all interesting. The buildings are all labeled with like builder's plates, which you'll see later, which tells you the years that they were built. And if you go online, you can get the whole story. So this being Vienna, like a lot of civilized places around the world, it's a mix of on-street and private right-of-way, but private right-of-way is often not exclusive to tram, it's a transit way. So the buses, can use it also, which is great. We're looking east here, and this is a westbound. It's actually a short turn to Kagran, which is another interchange with the original U1 metro. Matter of fact, Kagran used to be the original north terminal of the metro before it was extended further north. Anyway, this westbound is about to go through this S-curve onto private right-of-way alongside the street. Um, that's not a working farm. That is a botanical garden on the left. This is interesting. This is one of the spots, and there's not a lot of them. There's a couple of spots on the Vienna tram system where the two tram tracks cross each other in order to serve a single island platform between them. Um, they do this at an interchange on the 25 route. Um, it's a, a free transfer with the U-Bahn, um, but they do that here to service a very big shopping center. This station, which is built on a short elevated structure and there's a huge mall downstairs, but you don't have to drive to it. So this is why the tracks cross each other. You could have one platform with elevators. And then at the West End, as you can see on the right, they cross each other again to go to normal right-hand running. So this is heading further west. Um, again, on a transit way here, mixed bus. And you can see over here, um, tram and bus. And of course, the list of all the routes and the timetables. Uh, but every stop, generally speaking, every stop has a, um, a digital readout, which you can't see here because the tram is blocking it, of what is coming next and whether it's low floor, uh, barrier free, as the Europeans like to call it, um, low floor or not. Next day is Thursday, September 15th. Um, I started out on my own again. So I went back out to that same location, Krygrasse, Gasse, to pick up where I had left off. So I'm starting out on the U-Bahn with type U11s again. This is at Alta Danau, one of the outdoor stations. Uh, 
Um, in the background is the Vienna International Center, um, the International Atomic Energy Commission, and other UN agencies are in that complex. So he's a northbound. Uh, the terminal used to be Kagran, and it was extended some years ago up to Leopoldau, a modern elevated structure. It's very quiet because it's we here in New York call type one track, ballasted. Plus they have a whole nother standard of track maintenance. At Kagran, um, multimodal interchange, Uban, streetcars and buses. At this point in time, last September, it was still mandatory to wear masks on board any transit vehicle. And virtually everybody did. So this is the same stop as the previous day, only it's a cloudy day now, um, umbrella in hand. And as you can see, this is transit way, bus and tram. Just off to the right was this building. And I said to myself, self, that has to be an old railway station building of some kind. Well, it's not a crazy museum. It is the Bezirks Museum. Bezirk is district in German. And this is the museum for Donaustadt, which is the 22nd district of Vienna. Um, I think the second newest addition to the city of Vienna. So it turns out that yes, this is the former station building of the steam tramway company, literally. Um, formerly Krauss and Company. And that was one of the local old railways in the Vienna area. Continuing further west, more transit private right of way or transit way. Ah, so we're at Kagrana Plots. So the U1 is downstairs in its recent um, tunnel and the 25, 26 is up here crossing. The turnout that was removed here was the 25 and that was rerouted to a brand new residential street just a couple of years ago. And in fact, the 25 even earlier used to cross the 26 here and continue north but that was all abandoned with the U1 subway when it, when it opened. So that turnout is just off to the right beyond this tram. Oh, and here you can see one of those digital displays that are everywhere, everywhere. And you can see that, the well, it's still showing a minute away. So there might've been a second tram one minute away and you can see the little logo for the wheelchair telling folks that it's a low floor tram. Just like in New York, though maybe not to our extent, there's new construction all over the place. And not necessarily tearing down old for the sake of it. Um, fill in. I guess old buildings that couldn't be fixed up. Combination, here you can see bus and streetcar. These streetcar signs are kind of unique to Vienna. Unfortunately, they stopped making them new. You'll see later on brand new ones that aren't quite as stylish, but still convey the information. Here you get a very close up one. All of the bus routes in Vienna have the letter A. A lot of them used to be tram lines. I don't know this without doing more research, but the 27A bus could have been a 27 tram years ago. So 
So this is that new street that the 25 was rerouted to uh, just a couple of years ago. And this is where the 25 and the 26 join. Um, so he's turning left to go west to Floridsdorf Station, which is where he's going to terminate. The curve to his right is non-revenue. So I ended up going all the way to the west end of the 26th route on the north side of the other side of the Danube River from uh, Vienna, old Vienna. And this is the neighborhood of Strebersdorf. So this is heading up towards the terminal on a transit way. See the lettering on that building just to the left of the tram? That is one of those municipal housing estates. This particular one was built 1957-59. Those are the architects, it's 141 units. And they all have these builder's plates on the buildings. It's pretty neat. And they're all in beautiful shape. Turning off of um, Rusberg Strasse. This is only two stops from the end of the line. Um, and, but unfortunately, I had to get on board to go back for our dinner date. Friday, September 16th. This is the newest extension in Vienna. Uh, this only opened December 2nd, 2019. This is the south terminal of the D line, um, not the D West End, but the D Neustorf. Um, Vienna used to have a mixture of letter and numbered tram routes. Um, they slowly converted the lettered routes to numbered routes. Um, when I was there in 2003, they still had four lettered routes. Um, today, all they have is the D and the O. Not sure why that they just haven't given them numbers, but there you have it. So this, like I said, this is a brand new extension. This extension is one, two, three stops south of the main railway station, the Hauptbahnhof. The D used to terminate at the main railway station uh, before it was the Hauptbahnhof. Um, and I'll show you that. Um, but this is a, every, everything you see in this view is brand new, did not exist 20 years ago. Right here was big freight yard, and just to the left was the main tracks of the railroad. Looking the other way, this is before breakfast on this morning. I got out that early. And it's just beautiful. It's like perfect, high capacity, high speed transportation in a high density neighborhood. You build, actually the tram line opened before all the buildings were constructed. Of course, it's Europe. There are hotels. That's the Hauptbahnhof in the background. Oh, and here you can see the new style of tramway or bus stop sign. So yeah, it's got the obligatory H. It's got the name of the company, it's got the route there, D, the name of the stop, Alfred Adlerstrasse. Um, and there is a digital display somewhere. Uh, I might have been standing next to it. It's just not quite as classy. So that was the temporary interim terminal um, from December of 2012 to November of 2019. This was a this is one stop, a stone's throw from the Hauptbahnhof, which is just off to the left. 
So they operated this until just a couple of years ago, and then they ripped it out because it was temporary. So this is just to the left of that scene. This is the East Tramway Station for the Hauptbahnhof, which begins here and goes west to the left. This is all brand new and everything around it. Hmm. I may have to show you at the end. What used to be in this quadrant was two separate uh, uh, stub end railroad stations at a 90 degree angle. The um, Zudbahnhof, the south station, and the Ostbahnhof, the east station. Uh, and it's funny, but the, the south station extended to the west. And of course, the, the east station extended to the south. It was all gotten rid of, replaced by this, which is not stomated, it's a through station, and everything else was completely redeveloped. This was an early piece of underground tramway, um, not really a pre-metro, because all this is is a trolley loop. It's the terminal for the 37, 38, uh, 40, 41, and 42 routes. And there's two more tram routes on a loop upstairs, which you'll see. So this is connected to the U-Bahn underground. There's all kinds of really nice shops, places to get food, snacks, you name it, all underground. Took the 41 all the way out to the northwest corner in a neighborhood called Putzleinsdorf um, that happens to be a church bell tower on the right. So this is the terminal loop. Absolutely stunning neighborhood, uh, but most of the neighborhoods up here um, are gorgeous and you want to move there tomorrow. Served by tram and buses. There's other main routes that have excellent bus service. But the 40, 41, and 42 also operate with these um, the E2 and C5 trams. This is shared traffic, but the tram stop is built out like some of our bus stops for easy access. Okay, this is Gersthof. Um, there's a lot going on here. There's three tram routes, the nine, the 40, the 41, and the S45 um, commuter rail upstairs, which used to be one of the Vienna Stadtbahns. Um, you'll notice the intricate railing on the overpass. That, like the rest of the Vienna Stadtbahn, was designed by Otto Wagner. And you'll see another example coming up shortly. So the 41 tram uses the track on the left. The 40 and the number nine use that. And all three inbounds use the track on the right. There's one of the nines. Oh, and this is one of the short five second uh, articulated um, type A1. So even though he's the destination sign says Gersthof S, which is what this is, he actually goes one more stop, which you can ride. Um, but that's out of the way. Could not resist this, sorry. Guilty is charged, I like beer. So this is the outer end of the 40 line. Um, the neighborhood is all Gerstoff. This is Herbeckstrasse. 
Interestingly, and unlike most of Vienna, this terminal loop, uh, which is actually fairly large, it's a couple of blocks square, has no passing siding. What goes into the loop has to come out. And if a tram should become disabled, it has to get pushed out of the way somehow. But there is a little raised platform here um, for to make barrier free entry on the occasion when, when a low floor car comes in. So that's one of the outbounds heading onto the, uh, the terminal loop. Yeah, another one of those beautiful neighborhoods, tree lined streets, gorgeous houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody heading for the airport or more likely the railway station. And this is pure traditional mixed traffic. Just like Germantown Avenue in Philadelphia or Wayne Avenue. So the nine that terminated at Gersthof is using this as its terminal loop. He's making a left turn. The 40 makes a right turn here. So this is how the nines get out of the way. This is the stop after Gersthof. He sits there on the main for time. If a 40 should come along, he just goes around him on the siding. So this is the station building for Gersthof the S45, um, like I said, designed by Otto Wagner. This particular station building was completed May 11th, 1898. And it was, it was rehabilitated, ref refurbished really, um, I think 2008, 2009. took that, the S-Bahn, one or two stops, maybe one stop down to Hernals. So that's the S-Bahn going across overhead. Um, and now I'm gonna take the 43 out to Neuwaldegg. So you can see in the distance, the tram light has transitioned to the middle of the street, uh, but that's a transit way for the convenience of um, S-Bahn transfers, it swings over to here, also a transit way, um, but you don't have to cross the, any uh, traffic lanes to get up to the S-Bahn. All these Viennese, they think of everything. So this is out at the terminal at Neuvaldeg. Almost out into the suburbs here. You can see on the right, another one of the housing estates, much older. Um, looks like 1925, perhaps. Not too many places I know of where tramway passes a vineyard. This is the only example in Vienna. Um, so he's turning on to Dornbacher Strasse. And this particular vineyard is owned by a church at the top end of that hill. I don't know if they're open for wine tastings. I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to check that out the next time I'm in town. Anyway, um, B1783 here is in a special wrap. This is the only car in Vienna, comm not commemorating, but celebrating uh, the friendship between US of A and Austria. Kind of neat. So we're all the way back into Schottentor. You saw the lower level terminal loops. This is the street level terminal loop for the 43 and the 44, which goes out to Otakring. There you go. So this is looking southeast i believe um, east so you've got the 43 and 44 upstairs 
and the 37, 38, 40, 41, and 42 downstairs. Ah, yeah. So this was the second piece of underground tram, as little as it is. And this opened in 61, the lower level. Vienna did have pre-metro, they still do. Um, but I saw one commentary where the person that was talking about Vienna's pre-metro thought it was the worst transit planning ever. Um, but there you have it. Um, the first pre-metro was converted to the U2 subway in, um, I think, 1980. So here's a little bit of temporary right of way. You see the new trackage on the left. This is for the construction of the new U5 and a reconfigured U2. And I think it's supposed to open, I think the first piece is supposed to open um, the end of this year or the beginning of 24. Um, and that's going to be, I think, the U5, which is taking the place of today's U2. And the U2 is going through a newly constructed connection and heading off in a different direction. So this is the same station, but on the ring side of um, the trolley loops. So the Vienna ring has tramway going around the entire ring. Um, and they have circular routes. One is clockwise, one is counterclockwise, different route numbers. Um, I think the one and the two. Um, anyhow, here's an example of a counterclockwise on the one. So from this spot, and you can see the Hortz people. Um, you've got five other tram routes, excuse me, seven tram routes terminating here and a couple of routes on the ring. The one, the two, the O, the 71, and you'll see a U2Z, which is a subway replacement tram on part of the route. Um, I had to look up the lineage of the striking looking building on the right. And it was the original headquarters of the Vienna Bank Corporation from 1902, 1909 to 1912. The Vienna ring is very, very busy. Lots of cars, lots of trams, lots of well-used trams. But if you have patience and wait in one spot, you will get a shot, clean tram, not on top of you, no cars. You just got to be patient. Um, that building is the Opernhof and it was only built in 1955. The building that was there before was war damaged and had to be torn down. So there's a two going in the other direction. So that's a clockwise, I've changed street sides. Ah, so a loop off the ring heading towards Karlsplatz, which is the next block in the distance down that street, is where this U2Z terminates. And uh, this is a temporary operation uh, while the U2 has been cut back for essentially conversion to the U5 and realignment. So this will um this line will stop running when the u5 opens either at the end of this year or the beginning of 24. ah finally my first picture of a new type d um, these were ordered from bombardier transportation so the first 18 actually came from bombardier and the balance starting with 319 are coming from alstom at the moment, uh, these are only running on five routes, the 6, 11, 18, 60, and 71.
And there are flexities that are, Bombardier's flexity is a standard tram model, but they've been tailored to Vienna, hence, it, hence the flexity Wien, or Berlin, the flexity Berlin, and maybe a couple of other cities. I'm heading back to our hotel, so I'm changing cars at Schwarzenbergplatz. On the left is the Palais Wiener von Welten, built in 1869. And the statue on the right is the monument to call Philip the Prince of Schwarzenberg. Back at the Hauptbahnhof, so this is the other side from what you saw before. So he's northbound. Once again, everything, every piece of pavement, every blade of grass, every building is new. Ah, I did put it in here. So this is what that area looked like before redevelopment. So this is the um, Sudbahnhof. This is looking Southeast. So this is the Sudbahnhof heading west. That's the Ostbahnhof heading south and east. In the middle is the coach yards. Here's the freight yard. So you see this loop over here. That is still with us today. It's not used by a regular route. That is where the D used to terminate. This building here is a new, I think, I think it was built in 1951, combined building that they just called Zudbahnhof. Um, one of the two buildings was too far damaged from the war and they decided to tear down the other one and combine them into a single building, which is what they did. Um, so this was all taken down um, 20, 12, I think. Um, all these buildings on the south here, these buildings on the, I should say the north, the left here, uh, all these buildings to the right, they're still with us. But the same view today is that. So the Hauptbahnhof goes through the cord of where the coach yard was and is now a through station. This is where South Station was. That is where East Station was. And all this is where the freight yards were. Mine, it's amazing, just amazing. And the trolley loop is still there today, right there. It's just not used by a regular service. So this is on the ground in that view looking east. So just off to the right here was where the old station was. So this is an 18 car heading uh, west and south, uh, just east of the main, main railway station station. Uh, only the D stopped at the east end of the railway station. So this is one of the Alstom type Ds. This is looking west at the same spot. So you've got the 18 coming out of the tunnel there and the O stays on the surface. And the Hauptbahnhof is off to the left here. Of course, this building here is brand new. Um, so here we are down below. This is the first pre-metro and now the only pre-metro in Vienna. This spot right here um, was just an underpass under um, that plaza initially. And that this opened in 1959. The other pre-metro, that's now the U2 opened in 66 and that got converted for full Metro. This was extended from here all the way West about seven stations, 
It's like three and a half kilometers in 69. And several routes use it. Uh, the 18 uses it for its full length. Others come in and out. And here we are. So that's the underground station I just was at. There's the ramp. So it goes west under the, uh, the Gürtel, the outer ring road, all the way to Eichenstrasse here, uh, where it comes out. So you've got the, the Route 1, the 62, and the Vienna local bond, the interurban, coming in this way. So there's a whole separate station on this part. There's a platform here on this little extension where the one and the six go. And then the 62 and the uh, interurban go this way and the six and the 18 go this way. So like I said, under Zudtiroler uh, Platz right here, that opened May of 59, um, the real main section of pre-metro from Maria Hilferstrasse to Friedrich Schmidt Platz, uh, those two stations have since been renamed with the metro, uh, opened October 8th, 66, and it was rebuilt over two months, July and August 1980, to today's U2 Metro. Um, so this opened in January of 69. Never knew that. It was very interesting. So this is upstairs above that underground station with the other remaining lettered route, the, the route O. And another one of those short type A's. I then rode all the way back to Handelskai. So this is the east end of the S45. Um, hopefully they want to extend this further south along the Danube. Um, I think this runs exclusively with Bombardier talents. I didn't see any Siemens the Zero EMUs. Initially, the OB, the Austrian Federal Railway, OBB, UBB, UBB, uh, was not thrilled with the performance of these Bombardier cars, but apparently they've worked out the kinks and they're now working very well. They're certainly very, very comfortable from the passenger standpoint. And they are low floor, mostly. So this is the current terminal at Handelskai. Upstairs is the U6, the former Stadtbahn, and um, Esp other S-Bahn routes and regional and regional expresses. So here it is, 10.45 in the morning, tons of people. This is back at that Gersthof station, only when now we're upstairs. Beautifully restored, even though it's now 10 years ago. Little weed growth on the tracks, just like here. Um, that could be um, an ecological reason. They don't wanna use toxic chemicals, um, which I think is the reasoning why we have weeds on tracks here today. These class 4020s are still with us. Uh, they were supposed to be gone by now, um, just like the M3s were supposed to be gone by now. But due to delays from Bombardier and now Alstom, um, these are still around. Um, some of them are in a new paint scheme. This one is still in the old paint scheme, remarkably. So this guy is also a local product, Zimmering Graz Pauke uh, from 1981. So he's not ancient, but it ain't new. Then it was time to start making my way up to Grinzing for a dinner in a winery restaurant. So to get there, I had to take the 38. So this is another one of those transit right of ways. And this is up at the terminal in Grinzing. This is an off street um, 
private right of way loop. Um, yeah, and this is tram only, no bus. It actually goes under that building from the 1900s. Later on, after dinner, we come back into the Hauptbahn off to get a couple of shots. Um, there are a lot of locomotive leasing companies in Europe these days. Uh, back in the old days, you just had the National Railways and that was it. And that was fine because there was such a variety of motive power. And there still is. Although there's less of a variety today. There's a lot of new equipment like these um, Siemens Vectrons. Um, there were, Siemens has built hundreds of Vectrons for many, many different companies. Um, this one happens to be in operation on a Czech Republic train, which is actually heading to um, uh, Budapest in Hungary. Uh, but it comes from European locomotive leasing. And it's a fairly new unit, 2015. Another one of the Bombardier talents had just come in, had just arrived from Eisenstadt. Sunday, September 18th is our travel day to Berlin. So before I was time for our train, we took pictures of this, that, and the other. So we've got the Siemens Taurus on a uh, regional train to Villach. And over on the left is a German ICE, of which there are very uh, various different models, ICE, ICE2, 3. Um, I think this is one of the images that was on our website advertising the meeting tonight. This is one of the uh, Siemens the Zero mainline, MLs for mainline EMUs. Uh, which OBB has been extremely happy with. And again, like the Bombardier Talents, these are extremely comfortable um, MUs to ride. So first thing Monday, let me preface this. The reason for going to Berlin was for Innotrans. Well, during the week of Innotrans, Every single hotel in Berlin jacks up, jacks up its rates. So the places where we normally would stay um, out in Charlottenburg on the west side of Berlin that we love and we've been going to ever since the 80s were too expensive. So we found this beautiful uh, little hotel way out in the eastern suburbs in Woltersdorf. And the problem quote unquote, tongue in cheek, was we had to commute on this every single day to get into Berlin. Boo hoo. So the Woltersdorf Straßenbahn, which is part of the Vienna, Vienna, it's part of the Berlin um, fair region. It's integrated into the network. Um, it's the Route 87 these days. Uh, is the last operation with single truck motors, um, certainly in Germany. They make all the right noises. So this is what we commuted on every single day. This is the terminal. And we take the, this particular example is a Gotha with MGB electrical equipment from 1959. And as you can see, it's absolutely gorgeous, like it just came out of the shop. They take pride. This is the West Terminal at Ronsdorf. You go across the street to the S-Bahn Terminal, not, not Terminal, S-Bahn Station, which is upstairs. Uh, from what I found, uh, this station opened in 1879 and the route was grade separated way back. 1899 to 1902. Go upstairs and wait for the first S3 to come in, um, which is this. Um, most of the Berlin S-Bahn trains are now equipped with class 481s. 
that were made by a couple of different builders um, over a period of 10 years. Uh, this is their newer paint scheme, but similar to the original paint scheme. Most of these Espan stations, though ancient, were rebuilt in the last 20 years. Uh, brand new wooden roofs, you know, varnished. Uh, all the brickwork was repointed, replaced. Um, it's just in great shape. So we're heading out west. We changed trains here at Vestkreutz, which is literally west crossing. And you can see a train on the Ringbahn, which is a big ring that goes all around Berlin on the upper level here. Um, this happened to be on an S5 heading all the way out to Strasbourg. Um, by the way, Strasbourg is where the third interurban um, in the Berlin system exists. So this is one of the Adtrans uh, car uh, train sets. They're a little funny looking in my humble opinion, but, and they're unique to Berlin. So this first day was not Innotrans. We spent the day in um, Potsdam. And if you're ever in Berlin, Berlin, you have to go over to Potsdam it, it's, it's on the S-Bahn, it's the last stop, and it's a whole nother tramway system. So uh, this is the track map of Potsdam. Uh, Christian Stade has a phenomenal set of track maps at his gleisplanweb.de website. If you've never gone to it and you're into tramways, go there. Uh, it's not every system in the world, but it's a lot of systems. So as you can see, it's not huge, but it's big enough. I headed out to the north end up here because I had not, I'm, we may have gone there on the convention in 1990, but I just don't remember. So this is the very north end of the Potsway, Potsdam tram system at Campus Jungfernsee. This is a Somewhat new extension. It only opened up a couple of years ago. Um, most of Potsdam's fleet is new. Um, you'll see the exceptions. Um, they have a lot of these Siemens Combinos. The very end of the line here, the last couple of stops, Actually, you could see up here, the last two stops um, are single track. They do have plans and construction is supposed to have started um, next year to extend it further north and to double track this section, uh, which is private right of way side of the road. So here we are, this is at the Rota Caserna stop, um, the end of double track, at least temporarily. In addition to the Combinos, they have these Combino XLs. Center reservation. Yes, it's a rather dramatic sky. And I did have the brains to bring my umbrella with me. This is the junction of that Route 96 to the north and Route 92 to the northwest, which is to the left. I then hopped the 92 to the terminal, which is here. So these Tatra KT4Ds are now the oldest cars on the system. Uh, all of Potsdam's are originally from Berlin. Not that they're ancient. I mean, this particular pair was built in 1987. Um, and Berlin just removed the last of their KT4s. Um, I'm going to say two or three years ago. And they had been rebuilt a few times over the years, as you can see at the bottom. 
so I start walking this line back in and I get to this spot, which has got uh, like parkland on both sides. And I want to get this picture and it don't, doesn't just start raining. It starts monsooning. And I think you can see the rain in this exposure. Um, luckily, my umbrella worked. Camera didn't get wet. And there happened to be a break in service. There was some kind of delay. So I was standing out here in the rain for about 15, 20 minutes, but I got the shot. This is Potsdam's, an example of Potsdam's newest uh, Stadler Vario bonds. And these are from 2011. This is at that junction station looking east towards quote downtown. I then rode the 92 out to this short turn at Bizankits. And it's still raining. Tuesday, we had time to get onto Berlin proper. BVG is the local transit. This is the current map of just the tramways. It's a big system. Um, it used to be a much bigger system before the Berlin Wall. And in fact, um, it's mostly former East Berlin with a little bit of West Berlin here um, and here. Um, this section here is about to be extended a couple of more stops um, I th uh, very shortly. Very shortly. Um, so you could spend weeks and weeks photographing this tramway system. So since we were coming from Woltersdorf, um, we took the tram to Ronsdorf, took the S-Bahn one stop to Friedrichshagen and then walked down the street just a couple of blocks to the 61 route terminal here, uh, Ronsdorf Waldschenke. So here's one of um, Adtrans's originally GT6s, it's still a GT6. Um, and even though it's not old, it was built in 97, the BVG with the help of Sigalek uh, electrical equipment rebuilt it in October of 2015. A lot of these GT6s from the 1990s have now been rebuilt in-house. For whatever reason, there's a short section of gauntlet track on this route. Um, I don't think gauntlet exists anywhere else on the Berlin system. They have some single track sections in the outer reaches but I don't think I've noticed on the track maps a gauntlet section like this, right at Hartlebenstrasse. So if we go back momentarily to the map, this is <clears throat> out here. So we walked from Ronsdorf here into a Friedrichshagen S-Bahn stop and the 61 in red and the 60 in blue they do like a figure eight along this main shopping street here, which is this. So you're looking south here. So you've got both routes, 1661 on this main shopping street in both directions. And like Vienna, Berlin has digital displays to tell you exactly when the next couple of trams or buses uh, are coming. This is one of the uh, local, semi-rare locations in Berlin where the boarding location is unprotected. Um, but the motorists know that when you come to a tram stop, you better stop before that stop line over there or you're in big trouble. The sun came out, the sun went in, the sun came out, the sun went in. If you didn't like the weather, wait five minutes. 
So now we've gotten to the bottom of that figure eight and we're walking east to the end of the 60, another section of single track. And again, here's um, one of the AdTrans um, GT6s that was built in 2000 and it was rebuilt in 2016 already. The terminal loop in Friedrichshagen Altes Wasserwerk, which is old waterwork. Um, and you can see on the platform here, uh, raindrops, it just started to monsoon. So we boarded, we rode all the way back into Köpenick, uh, which is one of the really main drags in old East Berlin. Um, you would not recognize the street today from East Germany days. Um, yeah, there were stores there, um, but it wasn't vibrant. It wasn't super busy. Um, it, yeah, it's just a complete transformation, as you can imagine. So he's heading north, and he's about to take that turnout into the 68 routes terminal loop, which is also kind of big in a couple of blocks. So up above is the S-Bahn. That's north up that street a little bit, looking north, center reservation, right of, private right of way. Another block or two further north, and you get to the end of the 68th loop. Um, the 68 always terminates on that loop. Some of the other routes that go up to Malsdorf uh, sometimes short turn here. So this is on that main shopping street. Now, very busy, in traffic, doesn't seem to hurt the performance of the tram route. On our way back to the hotel, and what comes in but one of the brand new class 483s. Uh, built by Stadler and Siemens, or Siemens Electrical. And it's a short term to Friedrichshagen, so we're going to have to get off that, this particular train, wait for the next one to go to uh, Ronsdorf. The S3 goes all the way out to Erkner, which is on the way to Frankfurt on der Oder. Wednesday, our first day at InnoTrans. We've only been meaning to do, this has been on the bucket list for a couple of decades. So Innotrans is at the Messe in Berlin, which is a huge campus. I don't know how many acres, I'm sure it's easy to look up, but this is the South entrance and there's a separate S-Bahn station just for this um, Messe South. There's also an S-Bahn station on the Ringbahn, um, Messe Nord. So for 2022, there were 2,834 exhibitors from 56 countries, and there are 28 separate buildings on this campus. I and 137,393 of my closest friends from 131 countries were there. If you're into rail transportation, it's almost emotional to see thousands of people all interested in what you're interested in. One of the first exhibits we have, we went into the first building and there happened to be all these passenger information displays, which is just of a particular interest to me. Um, so FIDA is from Italy. Um, obviously, they're supplying some signs to the Israeli state railways on the left. Um, airports, trains, you name it. Altman from Germany, another one. Dactronics from Ireland. Some of the displays on the Long Island Railroad um, are from Dactronics. Uh, the, the newer ones are from Solari, but some of the older ones are from Dactronics. Speaking of Solari, a company that we all know very, very well, they used to make flip 
destination signs. Um, they make electronic destination signs today with the flip panel sound, if you so desire. Talk about tradition. Scheidt and Bachman had a huge presence. Uh, we're most familiar with their um, ticket vending machines. Um, I think escalators. They also do some kind of signal control. Another company making fair vending machine, fair ticketing machines, ICA Traffic of Germany. And then there's the outdoor exhibits. There is a whole yard of tracks at the Mesa just for this exhibition every two years. So I think I had in the bulletin recently, uh, or last fall, um, Vienna's newest Type X U-Bahn car. Um, here's the first set. I believe the first set has now been delivered to Vienna and is now in testing. It's extremely difficult to get unobstructed pictures in the or outdoor cart yard. There are, like I said, thousands of people walking around. So you've seen this in the bulletin, uh, one of Stadler's new Tina uh, low floor trams. This particular one is going to Darmstadt, Germany. One of Stadler's flirts for transport for whales. I'm standing on a um, set of stairs to get a little bit of elevation here. Another Stadler, um, a city link, also transport for whales. Amazingly, there was nobody right in front of me. One of the exhibitors outdoors had this former freight tank car that they converted into an exhibit car with a staircase and a walkway around the top. So that's how I was able to get these overhead views. Um, the East German Eisenbahn Railway is gonna be getting that Siemens De Zero on the right. Um, they come into Berlin. They have one or two routes that go through Berlin, uh, the ODEG. As you can see, there's all kinds of maintenance way equipment, um, there's one of those Siemens Vectron locomotives. Oh yeah, um, Mersey Rail in Liverpool and across the water at Birkenhead, one of their brand new class 477s, uh, which I believe is battery electric. Somehow nobody was in front of me. This is for the Czech National Railway. High speed, 230 kilometers per hour, which I believe is about 150 miles an hour or something like that, off the top of my head. Everybody knows these guys, Talgo from Spain. And that is a Talgo wheel set that would be under the articulation or in the articulation between cars. This was pretty neat. Kreiberg Strahl from Germany has um, highway crossing pieces that are friendly to bicycles with a flap, a solid flap that's easy uh, for the um, wheel to just push down on the flange, but hard enough so that bicycle wheels do not fall into the gap which can be deadly for cyclists. Wish we had that here. Overhead view of some of the exhibits, this happens to be Siemens. And you can see there's hordes of people all over the place. And this is what it's like all day long. Back outdoors, most of you should recognize this. This is the uh, Stadler Flirt Hydrogen for San Bernardino County in California. IA. Eh? 
a Stadler flirt aku for um, the Schleswig Holstein area around Kiel, Germany. A Siemens Mireo plus B for a Baden Wurttemberg state around Stuttgart. Luxembourg National Railways in Alstom Karate Stream. Uh, Navog from Poland was there showing their impulse to hybrid electric. Hitachi was showing off their Hitachi Blues, uh, which might be bi or tri mode. So if you're a car builder, you have to build a passenger car from lots of different sources, all kinds of seats. If you're gonna have any kind of food service, you gotta think about flatware. How do people eat? Be it a dining car, a cafe car, a snack bar, or a rolling trolley. And there are manufacturers for all those rolling trolleys. Oh, and there's Mr. and Mrs. Kaplan on the left. What do you cover your seats with? How do you pad your seats? You need doors? End of day one, came back at the south entrance and there's the Messezud station that's specifically in use for expositions. One sad thing about Europe in general is the graffiti. It's usually, usually never on the rolling stock or on station signs, but it's all over the infrastructure, possibly worse than in America. I mean, it's everywhere, except thank goodness, the rolling stock. And it depends where, back in Italy, they seem they're they're getting a handle on it. It's 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 improving, um, but you can see where the graffiti was, like on those two electric locomotives in Domodossola. Um, but they are taking care of it better in Germany. Certainly here in Berlin. Even though the equipment is lettered Deutsche Bundesbahn or Deutsche Bahn, actually these days. The operation is technically separate. It's S-Bahn Berlin is the name of the operator. Oh, note the condition of the track work. Yeah, silky smooth. And it's all underwriting. Uh, Berlin's S-Bahn um, is underwriting third rail, uh, just like the U-Bahn. An exhibit from Ukraine. Oh, the City Cube building here was just off to the right from the main entrance and uh, the railway companies had their exhibit, exhibits here. So there's Ukraine, Italy, in the background, Austria, to the left, Germany, Etihad Rail in the Middle East, had a very impressive display. Um, Austria was giving away hardbound track maps of their system that sells for like $35. They were giving them away. Yeah, I got mine. So not everybody walks to a rail station or takes connecting transit or drives. A lot of people, a lot of people in Europe bike to the railroad station. So you could either lock it up with these devices from Mero Key or if you have an e-bike, you can charge it while you're wherever you are all day long. I had to send this picture to my bike club. I could not resist this. Uh, Meta Servo Drives is from India. 
I don't know if they supplied the signs for the R211s, but the example they gave was just kind of coincidental. Cummins, although Cummins of United Kingdom was displaying their newest um, tier four diesel locomotive, diesel engine cutaway view. Gans Motor was showing their latest in trucks, or as they say, bogies over there. Even Rolls Royce was there. More trucks. First Alpine from Austria make track components and switch machines. The summer garden in the middle of the grounds was the, uh, the bus display. And there was at least 10 different buses there. Every single one of them was non-emitting, 100%. So you've got this a Van Hool, which is actually fuel cell battery electric. Autocar Europe from France. I, you guys may have heard of Otokar. I had never heard of them. This particular model gets up to 300 kilometers on a charge. Skoda was there with their H-City hydrogen bus and their T-City trolley bus. Kipa Electric from Germany had their KE18M. Solaris was there in force. Carsen from Turkey was showing this one with an unbelievable 450 kilometer range possibly because it's a short bus, but still. The end of Innotrans, we took the, um, the end of Innotrans that day, we took the S-Bahn back in, took some pictures around Hauptbahnhof. This is looking west, looking east. There's the famous radio tower in former East Berlin. Um, Deutsche Bahn also has Bombardier talents. Well, these are talent twos. He was heading from Wunsdorf through Berlin and heading ultimately getting to uh, going to Dessau. And you can't be on German rails mainline somewhere and not get an ICE. This happens to be an ICE2. Thing I love most about the German ICEs is. All the high-speed trains have liquor in their dining cars, but the Germans have beer on draft. God bless them. Another one of the many, many Class 481s. These particular ones from Bombardier and Henningsdorf, just outside of Berlin. Then we went downstairs to ride the U5. Of course, the last time we were in Berlin, it was still a two-stop shuttle. Um, it got united uh, just a short while ago. So this station opened August 8th, 2009, and not even both tracks. It was a single track shuttle um, to Brandenburger tour. And it's already been proposed to extend from here, north and west, across to the U7. This might look a little familiar to some of you. New York City did this with low Vs on the BMT a long time ago. These are narrow profile type IKs on a wide profile line. Berlin is currently having a car shortage on the large profile lines. So I don't know whether it was 
to start up service on the U5 through, but they had to borrow some small profile cars, um, pretty new ones, IK17s, um, all made by Stadler. So this is at the terminal, Hauptbahnhof. The next, uh, the next stop is Bundestag. This was the interim station on the shuttle. And here's a standard Type F76 um, in Berlin's paint scheme from centuries. Berlin yellow. This is one made by Wagen Union in 77. So these are as old as our R46s. Uh, Berlin is getting new cars right now from Stadler. They've been, these cars have been rebuilt twice, 1990 and again in 2017. And here's one of this line's newer Type H97s. Newer, 24 years old. This was the terminal of the shuttle, Brandenburger Tour, with um, a much older example from Orenstein and Koppel. Uh, Owen K built both large profile and small profile cars for Berlin. This was also rebuilt twice. Um, the station has video displays showing Brandenburg Gate through the years. This is brand new, essentially. So the piece in the middle didn't open until December 4th, 2020. So this is the westernmost of the new stations, Unter den Linden. This is a transfer station now. Old, new, well, it's not even new anymore. H95, even older, 1995. So like I said, um, this is now a transfer station. Upstairs is the U6, uh, which has been here since 1923. Um, and down below is the new U5. There never was a station on the upper level here. Uh, this is north of Französische Straße, which closed on December 4th, 2020, because it was too close to this. And it was much more important to have this free transfer. So this is upstairs on um, the U6, which goes north south here. And like I mentioned, underrunning third rail. Um, brand new station, no columns um, to speak of certainly none between or in the platform edge, very wide open, great for pictures. Notice the next train to Alt Mariendorf in the north is four minutes and then six minutes. And it's five after four in the afternoon, so it's early rush hour, unless this is a Sunday. No, it's a weekday, it's a weekday. So this station, the next one, Museum Zinzel, this didn't open until July 9th of 2021. So it's only not even a year and a half old here. It's a pretty, as you can see, a pretty dramatic station um, with the dark blue ceiling and the starlight. It's really beautiful. Um, it's, the station is reminiscent of Eastern Bloc metros and Russia with a huge island platform with big columns set in a little bit. So at the very center, if you're looking down it, you don't even see the trains. The next stop is Rotis Rathaus or <laughs> Red City Hall, I guess, literally. Each station has a different architecture. This is the this is an, uh, the oldest example of a Type seventy four that we saw on the U five from nineteen seventy four. Is a good view of 
wrote this right house. And then the next stop is Alexanderplatz, which used to be the terminal. This opened December 21, 1930. Old steelwork, riveted, you know, just like our subway. <laughs> very high ceilings, though. And very different tile work than what Board of Transportation here was doing. So there's one of the narrow profile type IK20s, very new. This tile work is, a, is reminiscent of uh, the Euclid Avenue extension from 1948. The very last day in Berlin, I'm on my way home. So this is at the New Berlin Airport, which was a disaster, very untypical for Germany for it to have been taken so long to build it and be over budget, but here's the brand new S-Bahn terminal. Das Ende. All right. Thank you, Jeff. You're um, welcome. Let me allow folks to unmute themselves and uh, you can start video if you like. Uh, Jeff, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank uh, you. A lot of uh, engagement in the chat, that's for sure. Um, do folks have any questions for Jeff? Just uh, go ahead and I, I couldn't I couldn't answer any questions on the chat because I was too busy yapping. Oh, no, that's that's <laughs> my design. <laughs> um, Jeff, what what um what camera do you use now? <laughs> it's a Nikon DF, F as in Frank. So it's old technology. It's probably 10 year old technology. Um, I like I love the results in good light, be it indoors and certainly outdoors. But if you're in low light, mm. I don't dare pump the ISO higher than 1600. Some of those shots you saw just now, you can see the grain. Mm -hmm. it's, maybe it's artsy, but I, would, I know with a newer camera, mm -hmm. you wouldn't see that. And, I, that the, and you wouldn't see a, it. Maybe, maybe. Is that the APS-C size or it's not full oh, frame? Oh, no, full frame, full frame. It's full frame. I'm thinking about switching over to a Nikon Z series mirrorless that I've only heard rave reviews about, regardless of the model. Yeah, if you know um, Brian Solomon, he's he just bought one. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. I know you. <laughs> uh, so great, great, great presentation. Uh, thank Fine. you so much. Um, a couple of quickies. Um, the Milan signal towers, the the uh, the elevated air interlocking towers. I mean, those are um, they're very famous. I mean, I've seen them in photographs before. Do you know? Well, two two things. Number one, do you know what machines were in those towers at one time? No. Okay. And and I, I guess by extension, do you know if the machines were removed or are they still sitting up there? Um, you could see in the windows of Cabina A, and it didn't look like there was anything in it, but okay. the structures are beautifully preserved, except for the graffiti at the bottom, which is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Yeah, no, I, I remember seeing but that. But not on the trains, thank but God. Not on the trains, right. Um, are they... Are they have they not been taken down because they're maybe considered historic? Maybe they're listed? I think so. They, they okay. may be, quote, listed. Okay, cool. And then um, the, um, the mercy rails. Yeah. Uh, only a portion of the fleet were ba are battery electric. I just checked. I thought that was the case. Um, and it also turns out the designation may actually be 477, not, I'm sorry, 777, not 477, unless the battery, 
designation, the battery vehicle designation is different than the, I, I need to check it again, but um, it's possible that the uh, the battery derivative might have a different designation. Mm. Um, Could be. Uh, and I think they just went into service. I think, I think, I think, yes. uh, in fact, our, our, our friend, uh, Mr. Marshall just filmed a video and posted on his channel of him taking, uh, you know, I think you're the, right. One of the first. I, I just went back to the Mersey Rail photo, and it looks like seven seven seven. Yeah. But one end could be that, and the other end could be. I don't know. Yeah. Seven. I. I yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I think they and I think they literally just went into service. Um. And then and then la the last thing um those articulated section units um. The ones built by Bombardier um, that you were, I think they were on the Vienna S-Bahn, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, although the front ends are entirely different, I think that section arrangement and, and the, the, the interconnections, they're almost identical to the Bombardier cars, to the cars that Bombardier supplied to Paris, um, called, the, called the Francilians. Those probably deck EMUs. I yeah. think Bombardier used that same articulated technology on those cars. Uh, but yeah, I recognize like those middle joint sections, not the front ends. The front ends are yeah. entirely different. Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, but that was it. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely incredible uh, presentation. Yeah. Real, real I, quick, I, want to thank, I want to thank everybody who's thanking me. Um, I, I do try to do some research. Um, so I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Jeff, we did have one other question in the chat, which was at InnoTrans, uh, yeah. was the, did you primarily hear English or uh, were there other, was the primary language something else at InnoTrans? It depended. Everybody, everybody, everybody spoke English regardless of where in the world they came from, because uh, that was the common denominator. But if people from Germany, Austria, Switzerland were talking to a German company, you know, they, they, they spoke German. Um, I noticed the same thing, Czech Republic, um, Poland. Yeah, they spoke native if they were Lansman. <laughs> Actually, I have a question about the guns. What the, uh, What is guns selling in, in these days other than the trucks? Um, that was about it, to tell you the truth. I didn't see a whole rail car. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean they don't make freight cars. Um, well, they used to make passenger cars. And yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Things, all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, they don't have anything outdoors that I saw. And you question see why this thing runs for four days. How, what's the entrance fee? <laughs> um, we actually got the um, corporate rate because both Noah and I used to work for rail transportation. It didn't matter that we were retired. Oh. And we, we got that through the US representative um, out in Chicago or Minneapolis or somewhere. At least in the past, I don't know. Oh, 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 but most importantly, so the entrance fee, for, good for four days, uh, was 30 or $35, but that included four days of a BVG pass for all three zones, <laughs> all the way out to oh, Voltersdorf, where we were in zone C. Free transportation for every attendee, all three zones, <laughs> including Potsdam. That's, that's pretty good. Well, they, they, there's a lot of incentive in Europe for people to ride uh, transit. I don't know if you're, you guys are opera fans. You know, in Munich, if you have an opera ticket, uh, they want you to I ride. Am. That's, yeah, yeah. After three o'clock, they, 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 the, the opera ticket includes a pass on the, on the system. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Jeff, that was really amazing show. Thank Very you. Nice. Um, what was the temperature like in, in Milan? It seemed like it might be a little cool. On the contrary, um, if I ever go to Milan in September again, I'm bringing shorts. Yeah. Um, Milan was hot. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to be. You know, we looked at the weather forecast, you know, the day before we left. And I think they were calling for, you know, a daily high of... 80 but i think it, i think it, it nudged 90 on one or two days um fortunately everything's air conditioned the hotels the restaurants the peter wits are not but you don't care the windows are all open and it's making all the right noises <laughs> true and you're in the shade i have a question about uh uh milan and the Piazza della Repubblica. Uh, I recall seeing years ago a picture overhead showing it appeared to be an effective grand union. Is it? Is all those tracks still there? I can answer that. <laughs> I'm going to say no. No, it's it's the three way. What they did is the the north south line through got truncated so it's a t right okay yeah it's, yeah it's a t now but they still have those sort of side tracks yes yeah there's three tracks in piazza repubblica right um three where stuff gets out of their way you know each other's yeah. way yeah i tried to model that in n scale oh my god <laughs> it's a lot of trackage <laughs> yeah <laughs> but in n scale is cheap <laughs> yeah yeah both Noah Kaplan and I, and his wife, um, we thought that um, Milan has had the same kind of urban vibe that New York has, um, for whatever reason. I don't know why, but it's got a similar feel, although the architecture, of course, is completely different. And barely any skyscrapers. And barely any skyscrapers. Um, I remember being impressed when I was there for the first time with the ERA in 1988. Thank you, Jack May. Um, but I had forgotten really how much I love the place, really. I, 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 it, I'd go there tomorrow if I could, in the words of Johnny Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Any other questions for Jeff? Uh, just a great show, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. I got your um, <laughs> comment. Um, right. that, that's out of my control. But you're right. There didn't seem to be a reminder. And I also say great show, Jeff. You always do a good job, and uh, it's always a pleasure. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> yep. a great show. Well, one of the reasons um, I like putting everything into PowerPoint because I don't need notes. Everything's right there in front of me and in front of all you guys. So even if I don't say everything, you see it. It's a lot of work to put all your pictures into PowerPoint. Yeah, I finished it up on Wednesday. <laughs> um, I think it took... Well, better than last year. Weren't you still editing up until the afternoon of the show last year? I don't know if it was last year, but I've, I've done that in the past. <laughs> I mean, back in the days when I was working for a living, um, there were times when I had to take off the Friday to finish the presentation. Yeah, I, I remember the one, my one ERA presentation, I had to do the same thing. I took that day off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you just retire recently? Did I what? Did I put it together? Did you retire recently? Five years ago next month. Oh, fine. Okay. And it's, gone by, it's gone by like that. Yeah, one year and three months for me, and it's, <laughs> it's not, I can't even remember. I've, exactly. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. All right, good night, everybody. All right. All right, Jeff, thanks again for a wonderful program. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, can you stay on just? After everybody else gets off, 
I can. Yep. I, I, I could just text you. Oh, okay. All um, right. I'm just curious as to what the count was. That's all. Uh, oh, uh, we got close to 70. I think we hit 70. Yeah, I saw 64 at one point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what can I say? I'm not a big drawer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it might have been because there wasn't the uh the uh, email today. Yeah. Yeah, we got to look into what happened there. And, and and you know, people could just be um ha have had a rough, you know, day and they were schnockered after celebrating in, in Manhattan all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's right. Too, right that in? Too, too much green beer. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hi Lou. Uh, uh, question, is it standard gauge over there, the metro? Yes. What's the gauge? Same as ours. 56 and a half inches? 1,435 millimeters. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Exactly. Okay. Or okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Finish over now. I'll get there. Okay. Oh, I see. Unmute. Yeah. I had to do it down the bottom. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great, great evening. Thanks for joining. Okay. Me. I'll be there. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night, Chuck. Thanks, everybody. Turn it on.